Hello everyone and welcome to the final session of the day, uh, Fusing Immersive Technology with Meaningful Learning. Um, a few bits of information about the live sessions, which if you've been watching before, you know already. Um, there's a chat panel located on the right hand side of the platform. So please feel free to ask any questions and the, our panelists will do the best to, to answer them. Um, if we don't get to them, don't worry. Um, they're saved in the system and we'll hopefully get back to you after the event. Um, there'll also be a slight delay as they are all moderated. Um, so without further ado, I'm so pleased to introduce the chair of this international session, um, Steve Bambury, Director of Digital Inception Consulting. Thank you, Steve, and over to you. Thanks, Sarah. It's great to be back, guys. As uh, we close out this latest guest event, I must immediately tread some water, it seems, because I think we've lost one of our guests just as the just as we've crossed the start line. Um, but we we will um, we will uh, soldier on, and and hopefully Amanda will be able to jump back in with us. Um, I would just like to take a personal moment and say thank you to all the people that have been sending me some some really lovely feedback on the uh, digital governance session, the pre-recorded session that. Um, has been accessible over the last few days. It's been really, uh, some really touching comments uh, sent to me on, on social. Um, it's great to be closing out the Leadership Summit uh, today, and we're going to be looking at immersive technology. And obviously, this is the Guest Leadership Summit, so we're going to be looking at it or trying to frame it within the uh, school leaders' uh, perspective. Joining me, I have Clint Carlson, Michael McDonald, and Amanda Fox, who is back with us. Hello, Amanda. <laughs> or is she frozen? She's back with us partly. Hopefully, she'll be back with us fully. Um, so, I'll tell you what, just while we wait and, and then buy Amanda a little bit of time just to try and secure her connection from Texas, uh, Clint, let's just jump to you. Just I'll give you a couple of minutes just to introduce yourself to the audience and, in particular, to frame your experience using immersive technology for learning. For sure. Uh, thanks for joining, everybody. Uh, my name is Clint Carlson. I'm the program director of digital education and academic technology at the University of Colorado in Denver, Colorado. So it is uh, morning for me, it's evening for most of you. Uh, I really got uh, my chops in immersive technology and XR uh, really through a passion for interfaces. I was a film editor, I was a web developer, I was a web designer, I was a project manager, but it all kind of built on the, the interface and how we interact with each other. So once XR kind of took its footing and started growing as something that uh, anybody that any consumer could use, uh, I immediately got involved. I uh, began building a XR program at my international schools, both in Delhi, India, and in Istanbul, Turkey, and presented those workflows on how to do XR cheaply and uh, quickly, uh, ready for you to integrate on Monday uh, with schools all over uh, Europe and Asia in the last couple of years. Now that I've relocated to Denver, I'm doing that in higher education. Fantastic. And uh, also joining us now, those of you that were with me for the panel during the last online guest event may remember that uh, that this gentleman, I, I, I finally revealed my, my, my love of his voice and, and how soothing I find his voice. Now, I, I was just before we started today, I was remarking that I've just actually just had uh, yesterday had the first uh, shot of the vaccine and I've, I've been having some pretty heavy insomnia today. So I think uh, Michael, I, I need you right now. I need you to soothe me. <laughs> but Michael McDonald, my good friend, uh, thank you so much for coming back online with us. Um, for those that weren't able to, to uh, join the, the previous online guest event, uh, perhaps you could just tell everybody a little bit about the amazing work you do with using uh, virtual reality for language learning. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Thanks for the introduction. And why wow, the pressure's really on now, isn't it? Really? <laughs> you just have to talk, my friend. You just have to talk. Like they say, I've got a face for radio, so I'll just keep talking. <laughs> it's the only thing I can do. Um, Clint, it's good to be connected to another blue shirt wearer. And um, that's nothing against Steve, Steve's Oculus t-shirt there, but um, good to be connected. We've um, Yeah, so my name's Michael McDonald. If you don't know already, I kind of talk a lot and do a lot in VR for language learning, foreign language learning in particular. That's English, to be specific. Um trying to help people improve the way that, it, that they talk this language or maybe teach this language to people who don't talk it natively. So that's nothing to do with child kind of language uh, development or acquisition or speech impediments. That's not my bag, but um, certainly foreign, la foreign language learning is. I've been teaching English for the best part of 10 years now, uh, studied foreign languages at university before that. So I know and feel the pain of what it's like to learn a foreign language. And five years ago, I got my hands on the uh, Google Cardboard, anybody remember that? And, and that was really my first taste. That was uh, my opportunity to take my students to any corner of the 
the world through kind of web-based experiences and immerse them in inverted commas in you know the streets of London if they couldn't get there and help them learn English in that way. Since then, obviously, we've seen the uh, the latest wave of VR. Of course, it's been around for a good while now, uh, longer than the Oculus Go's and Google Cardboard's turned up. But I've kind of followed that wave, and it's been really nice to do that. Certainly, coming at it from an educational standpoint, as you know, really a student of languages and uh, seeing how we can adapt this and answer some of the problems that do exist in the classroom because for me like I always say you know if you give me a tennis racket and a pack of Pringles and say these things will t- help you teach languages better than the VR headsets I'll put the VR headsets back in the box I'm not you know for me it's just the best way at this moment in time of how to teach a foreign language so that's a little bit about me and what gets me out of bed in the morning and look at the time in here because I think Amanda's back with us Amanda can you hear me I can can you hear me yeah, we can hear you as well. The perfect time, and Amanda, um, if you, uh, those that are, are joining us here, if you are not familiar with Amanda's work, you have been missing out. She has been someone that I have been lucky enough to uh, to to work with and to, to to collaborate with informally over the last couple of years in in the immersive tech space, um, and, I, and I feel blessed to have done so because she has been part of some incredible projects, including the virtual reality podcast um, and. Um, the, she's the author of Teaching Land. Uh, uh, but uh, Amanda, if you uh, would like to take a couple of minutes just to, to tell everybody about y- yourself and your background in particular, and hopefully we'll be able to maintain a, a good connection with you throughout. Yes. So um, I've been in education for the past uh, 10 years, and my uh, tech nerdy heart has taken me down the the VR rabbit hole per se. So back in 2013, I took a job at a one-to-one school with iPads uh, called the STEM Academy in Savannah, Georgia. And there, I I really got introduced to virtual and augmented reality through our makerspace teacher. And uh, Color and Erasmo were the first apps that I really got into. We did this whole, as a social studies teacher there my first year, we did this whole augmented reality um, gallery walk where we had uh, victims of the Holocaust that were on display and people could scan to find out more about their journey uh, through that time period. And uh, interestingly enough, Color, which is now Quiver Vision, mm. uh, I recently started Meta Inc. Publishing, which is an XR publishing company, having for- purchased my or published my first two books through Dave Burgess Consulting, Teaching Land, and Zombie, a Design Thinker, that leverage augmented realities to enhance learning, um, I decided, you know, why can't why can't we do this with kids' books, and why can't we build in a virtual guide or a virtual teacher into these books just by scanning a page, or make it more interactive? So, with our powers combined, Meta Inc. Publishing and Quiver Vision has uh, cre- are cre- are creating this line of augmented reality books that have content built in. There are these coloring pages, but when scanned and customized, they come to life and give like extra lessons to the students beyond the text of the book. For example, Marker Town, my most recent book, has a Ferris wheel on the page, but the Ferris wheel pops up, comes to life and breaks apart and explains a simple machine. So uh, I'm hoping that through the course of, you know, the next couple years, Meta Inc. Publishing becomes a a name in education, and uh, our we we're, the second book is in editing, and the third one's already in development. So, look look for more things from Meta Inc. Publishing, and and that's kind of where I'm at right now. Fantastic, and, and I honestly can't recommend Amanda's books enough. I was lucky enough to be one of the uh, I was one of the proofreaders on Teaching Land, and and it was phenomenal. And uh, on on a side note, obviously your your Teaching Land book, Amanda, is is obviously informed by your love of the of zombies and the, the zombie land movie, uh, zombie land movie in particular, you must be absolutely psyched that there's a zombie land VR experience coming out. I am. I'm super stoked. <laughs> so yes, my love of zombies definitely um, imbued the text. <laughs> so each each chapter is themed after a zombie movie, and there's a metaphor of, that that parallels you know zombie films and education that I string through. So it's it's an entertaining read. It's a bit cheeky, so it's not for the faint definitely, of heart. Definitely, definitely an entertaining read. Uh, it, it really is a, a, an easy and enjoyable uh, teaching book to get into. So, guys, um, I've got a few questions for you. We are um, 
we'll go round uh, round the clock, and uh, I'll give everybody an opportunity to to uh, to give some input. I'm sure there will be some questions coming in from the audience as well. Uh, we have the same uh, same degree of flexibility that we did the last time I hosted one of these panels for guests. Because we are the final session, we can overrun slightly. We have that that overflow time, so uh, um, we'll try and keep to the time limit, but. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get through all the questions and then take questions from the audience. If we don't get time to answer questions that you have submitted through the uh, chat, guys, then please do reach out to the panelists either through the guest platform or on social media. But the first thing I wanted to ask was, um, there's been a, a marked uh, boom in terms of interest in immersive technology, um, both AR and VR, VR I think in particular, in the last year despite COVID. Um, so schools have they've raised their digital baseline you know all schools now are fluent with either office 365 or seesaw or g suite whatever their you know their core digital learning platform is that they've had to become fluent with them because otherwise learning would stop so now i find with the work that i do with lots of schools here in the uae that schools are coming to me and asking you know what's next what what should we we need to now be future proofing ourselves and thinking ahead um, and obviously, immersive tech is, is is something that a lot of schools are interested in looking at. If you were asked by a school leader about where to start with immersive technology, what would be your advice, um, Clint? Since you're on, at least on my screen, you're you're in, you're, you're in the two o'clock position. I'm going to start with you. Absolutely, thanks, Steve. Uh, it is a very exciting time to be involved in immersive technology. There's so many entry points. Um, the XR startup scene is just growing exponentially right now. There's just so many uh, products that are trying to enter the space. Uh, and like any of these starting points and technologies, it's uh, important to make sure that the software is age and skill appropriate for those students, as well as making sure that it works within your existing ecosystem. I mean, if you're a whole Microsoft school and you start bringing in Apple products, those things are going to clash just like any technology integration. Uh, sure. XR is no different than that. Uh, but for younger students, I'm a huge fan of CoSpaces. Um, I've been using that for years, and it, it really is sort of a structured open sandbox that allows for students, I've done it with first graders all the way through into higher education, uh, to create XR experiences that can be quickly integrated into existing lesson plans from math to science, but also into the arts of theater and music. Uh, for older students, uh, CoSpaces still has a lot to offer because it does have some advanced physics simulation and pieces like that. Uh, but if you're already working with 3D modeling and 3D printers and you already have sort of a functional makerspace uh, working, uh, really see XR as an extension of that. Um, I've been pushing a lot of thinking about uh, Reality Composer, which is Apple's sort of uh, Apple's XR uh, creation component. Uh, and I've been a big fan of that um, in my position here in Denver, Colorado. Uh, we happen to be a one-to-one -one, uh, iPad school. I mean, we're a big Apple school. So when I joined and was bringing a VR program along with me, I uh, definitely wanted to tailor it towards the infrastructure that's already here. So we're working a lot with XR, but I think it's really, uh, what's nice about it is that it is open-ended, that you can find the right solution that's the right fit for, for your school and what's going on. And you can dip your toes in it a little bit and, and see how it goes without mass making some of these massive investments just to push all in at one time. Mm. It's interesting uh, because, uh, as, as you said, Clint, like like the ecosystem that your your organisation, your institution is working within, does inform what what you can use fluently. Um, and if you are, you know, an Apple school, if you are heavily in the Apple space, I do think that augmented reality is the more viable option for you, isn't it? Because you, the Apple aren't, you know, they're, they're obviously daily almost daily rumors about their headsets and, and what they're planning to launch but you know that the the, the high-end vr space the pc vr space and the space that companies like like your oculus and and vive have stepped into is is very much aligned with with pc isn't it yeah absolutely and the way i sort of view it is all right we've got all of these products that do similar things uh, so let's find ones that work within the ecosystem and let's be careful that the XR experiences that we're bringing into our classroom aren't just passive in view only. Uh, XR sure. is really meant to be interactive and collaborative and working with each other. So I think that's that's really, really key is to see that 
building an XR program in your school is to make sure that's an extension of your maker space and the maker movement. Because it really sure. is about creating those spaces to be able to build things and work with each other and, and build collaborative learning environments with your students just using the technology. And that's true sure. no matter what you bring in. So, I mean, that's true whether you bring in a maker space with uh, just uh, hand tools, uh, but same yeah. thing with XR. Fantastic advice, thank you. Uh, Amanda, what would you say? <clears throat> Um, I actually I recommend the same thing um, to start with where you are look at the hardware that you have and what software and platforms you can support uh, when when I was in in Texas I was developing a K through 8 computer science program for for a private school there and they were one-to-one -one iPads so I was limited to the iPads but I had a little bit of a budget uh, to where I bought tech I bought I brought in new tech that enhanced what we had so Again, with co-spaces uh, for the sixth grade immersive technologies class, this was a brand new class. Students were having it for the first time. We, we rolled out co-spaces and on the iPads, it was fantastic. But when I brought in eight Oculus Go's and then it, it was a game changer because then instead of experiencing it in three, you know, like 360 or in AR, they were able to put the headset on and walk around their space. And it, that's an, I believe that's an important component um, when you're creating and collaborating in VR because it's that iteration stage where they get to go in and they get to walk and they get to see, oh, my walls don't line up here. Or, um, you know, this, this is a little out of place. So when they go in and they test their space and then they go back and make improvements, pulling in um, new technologies for, for little, for youngers, um, I believe, oh, there's there's a... A kind of like a, a well, co spaces is great for youngers too. But there's a Halo AR, which is mm. a a new AR app that is yeah. everyone's looking for that. You know, a Razma HP reveal replacement, and um, that one's popped up. So I highly recommend that for for any teachers. Um, ThingLink. I know when my daughter was um, doing the little book readers that would come home. We would have my uh, my daughter and the kids in the class would go through and they would all add like a little bubble on the top of the book. And when you clicked on it, it would tell uh, what their heart, what they struggled with in the book or what words that uh, they that resonated with them. So there's there's thing link. There's there's like so many different um, entry tools, co-spaces, the Halo AR metaverse is a great tool. Quiver Vision for little. And I don't know if you Quiver Vision, if you've experienced it they are changing and evolving what they have right now. In the past, it's been a coloring based experience where, you know, students color and that's it, that, that kind of ended it. Well, they're rolling out a lesson plan catalog and they're, uh, they're building it out. So now the coloring pages are attached to standards. So if you're a standards based school in the United States, or if, you know, you, you need learning objectives attached, which I'm sure would translate in, in other countries, then they're already building it in and attaching each coloring sheet. So there's a shoe, for example, mm. and the shoe design is just you, you just design your own shoe. But now when you attach it to literacy standards and they have to look at theme and they have to look at uh, characterization and they, then they have to design a shoe that showcases the character's journey throughout a story, we've got like a legit entrenched curricular experience. And uh, the AR there kind of enhances that learning. They, they, they typically don't forget. I've read somewhere that 55% learning retention happens when AR is involved. So um, it's just a matter of making sure that the tool fits the curriculum, that the, yeah. the learning objectives are being driven, and that it, the platform fits into your ecosystem. And, and there are age-appropriate uh, tools, so just make pulling in that 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 age band and making sure we're working with with tools that work for for that grade level. I, I can I can tell you, Amanda. I taught a lesson with what we in the British uh, curriculum, what we uh, British uh, education system, what we call Foundation Two kids, so four year olds. In about 2014, using that shoe, uh, they were doing the story, the elves and the shoemaker, and then they had to design these augmented reality shoes as. as tied in with the uh, with, with the experience. Halo AR, um, yeah, again, I can endorse that for sure. I was one of the beta testers on that. If you are someone, if you're listening and you are someone that's been missing Orasma or HP Reveal, depending on when you were using it, you, 
it will depend what you know it as. If you've been missing that app, Halo AR is the app that you're looking for, uh, indeed. And I, I can echo both Clint and Amanda as, you know, uh, CoSpaces is always something that I recommend to, to schools. I've recommended it to a lot of schools recently. Um, and I think something that Amanda touched upon there, the fact that it's device agnostic, the fact that you can use it on iPads, the fact that you can use it on any headset. And I think some people don't realize that, you know, they, they know that there's the mobile app on the phones, but they don't realize that because it's web based, you can load it up on a Quest. Um, I've, I've used CoSpaces on, on Oculus Quest headsets. Um, and then you've got the AR side of it and, and the integration with the merge cubes, you know, it really does open up so many doors and you know it's also free to access at the basic level so you can try it out without fear of you know a, a heavy expenditure um michael we, we, we've covered quite a lot there uh, do you have anything else that you would add in terms of first steps into the world of immersive tech for learning yeah i mean like what um amanda and clint mentioned and you yourself steve the the whole kind of um content creation aspect of all of this i think is really fundamental when we talk about WebXR in particular like your mozilla hubs and your um frame by verbella people might be familiar with verbella will check out their frame platform which is mm -hmm. it's all WebXR. so effectively it's a link in a browser that you can share to people who have a vr headset you can access it in your firefox reality browser or others that are supporting it but also in a smartphone on a laptop on a pc and i think that's really where that kind of first step might be is actually before getting you know 30 students with 30 quests or picos whatever headset is you know uh, kind of up, up your street is actually trying to prove the model. And, and I'd kind of say, you know, approach this from an almost an entrepreneurial standpoint. If you're a school leader or someone looking to bring this technology into the classroom, treat the money like it's your money out of your own pocket and it's your child's inheritance. Because if you are going to be buying 30 Oculus Quests or something similar, giving them to 30 children or students and they're not going to be using them in ways that are going to be beneficial to their learning, their whole kind of, you know, passing exams, all of this type of stuff, then, you know, I think you've failed, quite frankly. I think you need to make sure um, that, you know, if you can work well with one Oculus device or Pico, HTC, whichever one it is, that, you know, can you scale that up with five students, 10, 15, et cetera? Because I tell you, the landscape changes the more devices you get. And often what I'm seeing is that teachers are very much like, oh, let's get the headsets in. Like, that's the end goal. No, that's just the beginning. And I think, you know, what Clint mentioned just right, right off the bat, and I wrote it down, he said the right fit for the school. That's fundamental. What are the problems? Where is the device going to or the technology going to improve the way people learn? And in my experience, just getting them saying, try WebXR, Mozilla Hubs, and we'll talk again in a month and let me know what you think. And, and, you know, you've provided a perfect segue to my second question, really, Michael, because the, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about is this. There is a, a definite sticking point for a lot of school leaders in terms of this assumption that a, a deployment or, an, uh, you know, a move towards immersive technology will have uh, will, will entail a, a fairly heavy capital expenditure um, and that the, the return on investment could be small. Mm. Um, but I think that what you've just said there, I mean, about scaling up is, is definitely key to, uh, you know, a, a more strategic approach. Clint, is, is that something that you, you would recommend as well? If you were if you were a school looking to invest in VR for the first time, you know, do you do you go and buy a, a full one to one set of uh, Oculus Quest 2s or do you look at maybe one or two within a lab space? You know, what what would you recommend? You know, this has really been a key part of the messaging that I've been trying to communicate to schools and through conferences uh, for the last couple of years. Um, if you are in a school right now and you have the problem of all of your students being attached to their smartphones and walking around uh, as if they're zombies attached to these devices, I, I really suggest uh, that you take a, a, a different angle look at that problem and see that if you've got students that all have smartphones in their pockets right now, You've got a one-to-one -one XR program in your school right now. You just might not realize it. You just need to develop the workflows and the ways to integrate that into the classroom and get that going. And you can do these for or virtually free to get your foot in the door. And then build on those successes, build on that integration, build on those conversations within your school. And then in a couple of years, when you've got that momentum and you've got all of the data proving that this improves teaching and learning and collaboration within your school, then you can look at making a larger investment. But you don't have to jump in with a, a multi uh, 
five-year plan of uh, this isn't building the computer labs like we were doing back no. in the day. This isn't providing one-to-one -one laptops necessarily. This is getting our foot in the door on how to start doing these super exciting projects for very, very low cost with very, very short timelines. And my pitch has always been, hey, here's some XR projects that you can introduce to your class on Monday without any additional hardware. Let's get the foot yeah. in the door and build that enthusiasm. And then you've got an entire school of, of support that is pushing that program instead of you just trying to integrate it solo as the, the tech person in your school. It is something that, that I've spoken about at a few events that the, the I think that we were somewhat spoiled in education by the, the rise of mobile technology and the shift towards one-to-one -to -one and BYOD because we went from you know the paradigm where there were laptop trolleys that probably weren't used as much as they needed to be because they were out of sight, out of mind to this really accessible, fluent device that all kids had at home as well, all of a sudden, well, at least here in, in Dubai, that's definitely the case. So suddenly BYOD become a lot more feasible, one-to-one -one become a lot more feasible, and you could, you know, you could wrap your pedagogy around that provision. And I think some schools now, they, they see, well, what, what, we, we'd end up with five, and there's this misconception that we're gonna end up with that old, you know, the old system where you've got kids queuing up to have their go. But I do think that we've evolved beyond that in terms of digital pedagogy. We understand now as, as educators that that isn't acceptable, that you shouldn't be wasting learning time while kids wait to have a go. But there are definitely, uh, you know, pedagogical structures that you can implement where you can, you know, harness immersive technology, either, as you said, Clint, uh, you know, for using existing hardware or as part of other systems where you perhaps you know, you've got it as one option within a range of other activities. Um, Amanda, I'm going to tweak the question slightly for you, if that's all right. Um, we're at the okay. point now where somebody somebody asked me just the other day about um, about VR headsets. I, I, I would say on a weekly basis, someone will email me and say, we want to start using VR. Where do we start? And I always say the same thing. You know, I can't give you a, an out of the box answer to that. Um, but Heads, it tends to be quite often that headsets is what they want to ask about. It's 2021, we're almost halfway through 2021. The mobile headsets, as Clint had just alluded to, you know, we've got kids with phones in their pockets, but we've seen a massive drop off in in the the mobile VR space. I, I, I think, uh, you know, the development community is very much moved away from, um, from the mobile, um, mobile phone development and move towards your, your Oculus, um, especially since the original Quest came out. Do you still see mobile VR as being a worthwhile uh, investment for a school? Or would you, in, in other words, if, if a school's got uh, phones in all the kids' pockets, are they better off investing in mobile headsets that these kids can put their phones inside mm. or a small bank of Quests or similar? Um, okay. So I, I would say it depends on your budget. So if if you are one to one and with mobile devices and students do have them, buy the mobile headsets. Uh, you're not going to get the six off, you know, uh, same experience that you would get in a Quest Two, uh, but you're still going to get a better experience than just the 360 that they would get. And Merge Merge is still creating and making their mobile headsets, so that's a good, mm -hmm. wonderful headset made out of that marshmallow foam so it's easy to sanitize when sanitation's like on the front of everybody's minds right now with covid That's a good point. Which, yeah. I, which i think is also slowed down a little bit with uh vr i know in my own school i wanted to um implement immersive tech but just with with uh i guess pep and um sanitation it's it's more like well, how can we do this safely right now um also if you're looking, if you're looking to buy a headset, when when I was in Texas, uh, I I pitched, I had this budget, and I pitched this program, this immersive tech program that was going to span from fourth to eighth grade, but I was only spending a quarter, not even, I would say a fifth of the money because I I, I planned it over the course of three or four years, and the reason why you want to do that, even if you have the budget now, is uh, think about the, so what the metaphor that I had was there was this carpet in the room, but it wasn't one big piece of carpet. It was sectioned out. So if someone spilled something here, you could pull that piece up and replace it. 
Well, mm. technology is a lot like that. You don't want to do a blanket approach. You don't want to spend it all on the same thing because it's going to become moot eventually. Look at the Oculus Go. So mm. uh, everyone's moving now to Quest, not even Quest, but Quest 2. So you're going to want to diversify whatever you have, whether it's mobile, whether it's a couple of headsets, whether it's PC powered, because when you diversify and you, you plan out over the course of several years, you're, you've got that carpet mode in place. Okay, this section of my tech arsenal is outdated. We're going to pull this piece up and replace it. And it's the same thing with iPads and other technology. You have to have mm. a phase in and a phase out plan mm. because uh, VR and XR technology is constantly evolving. Uh, it, it's, 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 it's evolving faster than iPads. Like it, it's getting better every year and um, less expensive. So if you put all of your eggs in one basket, when you're at the start of your program, the next year you might've been able to get a, a better piece of technology for less money and to cover more students. So the big thing is, is, is to just be smart with how you're spending your money. Look at what you already have, buy one or two big ticket items, but then um, look at platforms that have the most return on investment. So my 60 English students that I have right now, 300, $400, I got co-spaces. They already had the iPads, we're doing that. So mm -hmm. we've already been able to integrate that into, into the platform, but then next year, we pull in a VR headset or two, and in that iterative stage, they get to pull those in now um, as, as they learn a little bit more about the coding aspects. So I think it's sure. that phased in tiered approach. And, and there's actually a question coming, Amanda, which I think builds on, on what you've been saying. It says, uh, XR is growing. Do you think it will be more widely available in 2022? And I would say that the obvious answer is yes. <laughs> but year on year, we're going to see smaller, faster, cheaper uh, as kind of standard, you know, um, as you said that the rate of development within the immersive tech field is uh, is incredible. And um, there, there's, there's so many big companies focusing on it. You know, as soon as you've got Apple, Google, Microsoft, all focusing on, you know, something at the same time, it, it's driving the entire tech industry forwards. Um, the other question that's come in is, uh, how is immersive technology accessed for learning? I think that one's a, a quite a broad question that we might need to stick a pin in. But what I will ask is, um, you know, the, the name of this panel, in, in the, the name of this panel, um, and shout out to Danny from the guest team, Danny Mesbuffer. for, um, he, he threw the word fusing at me in a sentence. And I said, oh, I like that. So we, we, we tweaked the title to fusing immersive technology with meaningful learning. Um, so my question to you, uh, and Michael will come to you, is what does that mean? What does that look like if I'm trying to fuse immersive technology with meaningful learning? Okay, not just for show, not just for spectacle, not just when a school inspector is walking around or your principal or your CEO or, or, you know, or your school owner is on a tour and you want to put something shiny or on your YouTube channel to, as a PR stunt, you know. How do we make sure that your immersive technology can be fused into learning experiences in a meaningful way? Yeah, I guess um, it's connected again to just what Amanda touched on as well about the kind of tech arsenal, the interesting terms you use, because you're absolutely right. You do need to plan for the, you know, the eventuality of the bombshell of Zuckerberg saying, oh, you do, you do need to log into those devices uh, using your Facebook <laughs> password. Um, and, uh, so that that was a bombshell that I had to kind of contend with before COVID even arrived, and then I realised what bombshell. So was hang on, Michael. Right. Let me let me just explain because there, there, there may be some people listening that don't actually know what you're referencing. So for those that are, are unaware, with the launch in parallel with the launch of the second Oculus Quest at the end of last year, um, Mark Zuckerberg, Oculus is owned by Facebook, and 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 Zuckerberg decided that from then on every new headset. Uh, that the Oculus accounts were going to be phased out and that you have to have a Facebook account to set up a, a, any Oculus headset moving forwards. And, and for a lot of schools and educational institutions that KO'd their use of Oculus altogether. You know, I, I was talking to Jeremy Balenson at Stanford and, and he said we've literally had to just take all of our Oculus and put them in a cupboard because we can't touch Facebook stuff. Um, so they, this is something that you had to contend with. Uh, you had to contend with yourself, Michael. 
Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you know what it's like applying for a uh, kind of funding for a project. So there's a long time you wait, you do the application and you finally get it. And then they you find out a few weeks later that what you've just bought is kind of, in a sense, um, I don't want to say redundant, but certainly you've got uh, to overcome now the barriers of, or, you know, the, the justified barriers of contacting parents, making sure they're familiar with what you're going to about to get their children into, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, that's what kind of gave birth to the whole let's create like loads of stuff in Webex are using Mozilla Hubs and Spoke. And that's the second time I've mentioned that today. They're not sponsoring me to talk about them. I just absolutely love it. Um, but um, in terms of fusing, you know, what is meaningful learning? Like I could give a, maybe a more contextual example of language learning. When we, you know, I've, got sure. a book, I've got a book right here. Many people might be familiar with the Cambridge exams. They're great. They're fine. But you need a book to follow. You need to go through the chapter one by one. But, you know, that's not really relevant to meaningful life, how we would apply language when we get out into a train station. You need to get a ticket or buy a drink or order food in a restaurant. So, you know, for me as a language teacher, meaningful uh, learning means social interaction. And, um, you know, what, what Clint mentioned, fun, you know, interestingly about the, the zombies attached to the smartphones, that's kind of, you know, it, it's so far away from, you know, like we, we are in danger as a kind of species of going so deep into, oh, we need this technology in order to achieve this particular goal. But actually, mm -hmm. I think, you know, the, the research shows heavily that it's learning happens when there's social interaction. And when we talk about um, VR, that is our opportunity, I think, more than any other time in human history to bring people from all walks of life together. When I say people, what excites me most is young people because never before have you been able to put in a virtual space in Italian with an American, Canadian and an Indian and whether they're on a VR headset or not because it doesn't need, you know, it could be non-immersive VR using your, your browser-based experiences on a laptop um, and just getting them creating stuff, sharing ideas. And and I think, you know, coming back to, I think, the question before there, Steve, about, um, you know, school leaders and how they could use this technology, I think this is the key point. It's not about getting as many of this technology in the hands as of many people as possible. It's about understanding more deeply what's the ethos and approach to education that your school has and where can the technology align with that? Because if the examiners walk past the school inspectors and they see all this great stuff going on, but really in the end, there's no benefit to the students learning or the way teachers teach. It's, in my opinion, been a failure. Um, we are, we've been given a golden ticket here. We need to make sure that we bring people closer together and actually, you know, scratch a lot deeper than just, oh, I've, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, seen a 360 video on any device. Uh, there's a lot more to it than that. Sure. And Amanda, do you realise at this point, all of us have said the word zombie at some point. That's clearly your doing. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I um, have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Clint, um, obviously, following along that same thread, I, I, I definitely, you know, I, I've, I've seen Michael in action teaching his language classes and uh, yeah. and, and seen the impact that it can make. Is, is this something that that you would would second? You may, I, I think, something that Michael was kind of touching on as well is from the that I always you know, hold in high regard in terms of immersive tech and VR in particular is the contextualization of learning, you know, understanding the history from the past, understanding the human body from inside it, you know. Um, is, is, are these the kind of concepts that you've played with as well? This is probably the most important concept of maybe this entire conversation. Do not bolt on this technology into your existing program. There's so much to do besides purchasing hardware and software. The real work, like everything in education technology is finding the places in the curriculum and in your teacher's lessons plans to integrate this while building the capacity of your educators. Uh, this is not a solo project that you're bringing into the school exclusively. So you need to work with your teachers, your curriculum directors to understand the and view the scope and sequence of an entire course, of an entire subject matter across multiple grade levels and find the interesting ways to integrate that augmented reality or that XR experience without overhauling those teachers' valuable plans. Because that's sure. how you analyze almost immediately. And just like how we integrate all technologies, you've got to meet each individual where they are and find the entry points to bring this technology into what they're already doing. A couple of years back, I created the What's on Your Virtual Plate project uh, in partnership with CoSpaces. And hmm. the idea was uh, not just to create a, an XR experience for the sake of creating an XR experience, but to improve an existing lesson plan on global hunger and global logistics. So we built this project where second graders were building the latest plate of food that they had eaten, but then also including a voiceover explaining a little bit about that food. And now that has spread all across the world. So now anybody yeah, with a project, yeah. 
or anybody with a smart device, even if it's just a phone, can hold their phone up, look down at the desk in front of them, and see a plate of food from somewhere on the other side of the world, and then hear that student voiceover inside explaining, this is where these ingredients came from, this is where they were shipped in from, this is why we eat what we eat in my home, in my culture, in my community, and it created a point of a much larger conversation that fed into the unit of that subject matter, of, of understanding why is um, breakfast in Tokyo different than breakfast in Mexico? Why sure. is that? Uh, it's a variety of things, and it opens up this conversation and really turned that unit on food and global hunger into something really, really special. And it wasn't focused around the XR experience, but the XR opened that door to have a, a better learning conversation with all those students. Sure, I, I think that, you know, echoing what you were saying, that there's a lot is made of the fact that technology like VR can be used to break down the walls of time and space. But yeah, it, it can break down social walls and, uh, and and help students develop understanding of different cultures, which is one of the most powerful uh, benefits of, of the medium. Um, Amanda, this isn't another computer lab. This is building a pedagogical shift of the paradigm of how we teach mm -hmm. and learn and collaborate and work together. And how we learn, yeah. Um, Amanda, is there anything that you'd like to add to, to this thread? Um, just that, just like uh, there are platforms that can be device agnostic, VR is subject agnostic. If you can imagine how an experience can be connected to a curriculum, you can make it happen. So when, when the Go first came out and I was more entrenched at cataloging every app that was on the, there were not as many as there are now, <laughs> but um, I was I was like entrenched in this process of categorizing the app, the age appropriate level, and then what content that it would fit with, and what and then developing a lesson that that was entrenched in good pedagogy that that was uh, learning outcome driven and um, accessible for teachers in the building. And the goal, Steve, you developed one for me. Do you, I you did. remember? You, yeah. You, you sent, yeah, you sent one over. Brian Costello did one on the Egypt, the tombs of the Egypt VR one. Um, and I had, I think, Paint VR. And the Paint VR was Bob Ross meets uh, Williams Wordsworth. And someone would read the poem, and the Bob Ross was in the head, headset having to actually paint what, what was being read to them. So uh, just just translating imagery into visuals and just any anything you can do anything with virtual reality. It, it's not for one subject. It's not its own subject. It doesn't belong just in a makerspace or a computer science lab. It it's it's it should be invited into every classroom. And if you have if you're lucky enough to have a cart with headsets, the best thing that you can do is go and interview each teacher. And if you're on semester or trimester or quarter, find out the big theme that they're covering, find out the big projects that they're doing and figure out what's out there, what exists, and if it's appropriate, how it can um, integrate into that project. And that's, that's where I start with my teachers is going in and figuring out what, what they're already doing and then where's the best place this, this would fit. And sometimes it doesn't and that's okay. But when when it fits, it's it's really magical for everyone involved. Okay, guys, I've just clocked the time, and we are we are basically out of time. Uh, I know that the the, the guest people um, they they won't mind, will you, Danny? <laughs> you won't mind if we overrun run for, for just a few minutes. Um, I'm going to skip um, my fourth question. Just jump to the last one though, just because I think it could be quite useful for for our audience, especially if we've got school leaders in the audience with us this evening. Um, so. I just wanted to ask you for any advice in terms of where school leaders or, or indeed any educators can go to find out more about harnessing um, immersive technology, maybe something projects that you've been involved with or, or things that, you know, you know, sources that you yourself use. Um, I, I've already given a shout out to the to the virtual reality podcast, which is uh, Amanda, Steve Sato, Alex Chaucer and uh, James McCrary. Uh, and James was actually with us last time, wasn't he, Michael, on the last one of these? It was indeed. So, I mean, Stephen Sato, if you're listening, you're next. Um, <laughs> but um, there's, there's a, a wealth of, uh, of great uh, resources and communities out there. So what, what would you, what would you be your personal recommendations? Michael, where, where would you direct people to go to find out more? 
www.educatorsinvr.com. Um, I could stop yeah. the answer there, but go yeah. there. Uh, there's go almost 3,000 strong of academics, yeah. researchers, students, startups, uh, covering everything from language learning to STEM to diversity and inclusion. You need to go there and, and just get the conversation going because we're all kind of in the same boat together. We, us, us four might be on this webinar and so we look important with our blue shirts, don't we, Clint? But at the end of the day, it's, it's literally just arrived this technology and you know we're kind of still working our way through it as well so um yeah. you know uh, i think everybody deserves to be part of the conversation so definitely check out educatorsinvr.com yeah big shout out to daniel bryant and, yeah. and, and the educators in vr crew there they do phenomenal work uh clint what would your recommendation be twitter 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 um there's so many cool projects that are just popping up all over the place from all around the world and the the low barrier of twitter it's amazing to see uh, the Educators in VR Discord channel is amazing. Yes. Uh, multiple sub-threads for any little nuanced question or idea you have. There are people in those things having conversations. And I think conferences like this. I think one of the, the, the benefits of, of COVID and this pandemic is that it forced all of these conferences to be virtual, which I think has created a, an equity of people being able to attend and be part of these conferences. There's sure. so many people who are able to attend things like this and hear our voices like this that wouldn't have been able to do so uh, back when things were normal, back when the logistics of travel and, and lodging and everything get in the way. Uh, things like this are popping up all over the place. There's so many conferences that are super easy to get into and hear what people are talking about and start those conversations and networking. I think it's a really good point. You know, that suddenly people have always heard of BET or ISTE or GUESS or any of these big brands, the FETC one, you know, there's they're all these conferences that are in different parts of the, of the globe and can't necessarily get to them. You know, there are now opportunities to, to engage. And uh, and on that note, obviously, it's been phenomenal to, to have the pair of you join us. Well, the, all three of you, because, uh, Michael, are you still in Italy? I am. I'm not going home. The food's too good. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, indeed, you know, we have got an, a, a, an international panel here. Um, Amanda, uh, what would you say apart from uh, your own podcast? <laughs> um, if, if they're looking for a book, uh, Jamie Donnelly just released The Immersive Classroom. It's a new book that came out. And I think there's going to be a lot of apps and platforms, but also practical applications that are uh, – that are used in ways that are driving learning objectives. She does a really fantastic job. And if you don't follow her on Twitter, you need to. She just did 31 days of, uh, of AR, VR, and EDU. And she's, she's always on not only the latest trend or the latest app that comes out, but they're, they're presented in a way that it's not a fad. It's not like the cool, shiny new thing to do. Most of the time, they have educational merit. They have educational value. So um, I want to give Jamie a shout out. I, I would recommend. Mm. I would highly recommend her book for anyone starting. For sure, and, and uh, her first book, Learning, Learning Transported, is readily available as well. Sorry, Clint, I talked over you, my friend. No, I talked over you. <laughs> I posted Jamie's uh, website in the in the chat as well because it is full mm. of all those resources, all in one place. She's and coming back to what you were saying, Clint, I I, I think in terms of Twitter, the the. Still a little bit of variance in terms of knowing which hashtags to follow or ha which hashtags to use in this space. And I think since XR has kind of become the, in some circles, the go-to blanket term for AR and VR, you know, we went from having VR in EDU, VR in education, AR and VR in EDU and in education. Now there's XR in EDU, XR education. There are a lot of variations, but Jamie's original old school hashtag which is also the name of her site, which Clint's just put in the chat there, ARVR in EDU, is, I would still say, still the most heavily populated and most commonly used hashtag. That's the one that I use. If I'm posting educational immersive tech uh, content, I will always drop that hashtag on there. Uh, Sarah, I can see you popped up and you've disappeared again. I think you're, you're trying to kick us out. Is it last orders? <laughs> you're on mute. She's on mute. Quick, another question. Um, well, we all need a sign, don't we? You're on. You're on mute. Um, thank you so much, guys. Uh, that was that was brilliant. Um, what an amazing way way to 
in the event and from the comments in the audience they've enjoyed it as much as we have um, so sadly that was the final session of the day um, I'd like to say a big thank you to our platinum sponsors Aleph and Microsoft and thank you to everyone else who supported us we couldn't run these events without you um, the GRIP platform will be open for a month after the event so if you want to watch any of the sessions again take a look at the product video library or connect with our sponsors, speakers or your peers, you can do it through the platform. Um, next week we'll be publishing videos to guesseducation.com so you can watch them all again there. Um, all that leaves me to do is to say thanks again, goodbye and hope to see you all face to face at Guess to Buy in November this year. Um, thank you and take care everyone.